Come on. Let's bow our heads in a word of prayer. Lord God, we have come here today to hear from your spirit. So we open up our hearts and our minds to receive all that you have for us today, Lord God. As we, as we continue in our series, Lord God, Reasons We Believe, Lord God, we know that we know you in our heart, but we want to we understand, Lord God, and have the knowledge and the wisdom to be able to explain it to the world, Lord. So we open ourselves up to receive all of your wisdom here today so that we can have an answer for the reason, for the hope that is in us, Lord God, to all who ask. So we thank you and we give you praise. And Lord, I offer myself just as a vessel. I'm just a vessel for you to speak through. So, Lord, let every word that proceeds out of my mouth be true and let it be encouraging and challenging to your people that we might be transformed more into your image today. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise the Lord. All right, well, listen, y'all, we are continuing on reasons we believe. Turn in your Bibles. How many of y'all got your Bibles? We're going to be talking about the Word of God today. Hold it up high. All right. My goal for you today is that when you walk out of this place, this Bible, these words are more than just words. It's more than just a book. It's more than just a religious writings. But this is the true word of God, and you're inspired to read it every day and let it transform you. We have been talking about reasons we believe. Last week, we discovered the evidence that there is a God. Without a shadow of a doubt, God exists, and it is made plain by the invisible things, the Bible says. We clearly see that he is. But today, we want to move from if he is to who he is. See, we've established that there must be a God. And we agree with all the philosophers and great scientists who have discovered God through that, even great thinkers like C.S. Lewis, who went on to tried to disprove God, but only found God and became one of the greatest apologists of the 20th century. It seems every time someone sets out to try and disprove God, all they do is find him. But you know what? The Bible says you will, you will find me when you seek me with all your heart. But he didn't say why you were seeking him. He just said, if you seek me. So we got people trying to disprove God, finding God. It's amazing. So we know that he is. But with C.S. Lewis in particular, excuse me, he went from uh, 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 on a process of believing that there is a God to discovering who he is. So today is about discovering who God is, now that we've established that he is. So I want you to turn in your Bibles real quick to 1 Peter chapter 3. I just want to read again our foundational scripture and reiterate why we are going through this process. You know, God gave us a brain, and the human brain is amazing. The way we can process information, the way we can think in the abstract, the way we can reason and come to conclusions, make decisions to change outside of uh, any other uh, influence. It's amazing what God has allowed us to do. But for some reason, we think that once we become a Christian, we need to shut off our mind and we just, just do. No, God gave us the ability to think and reason because through those things, we, we discover him as well. We need to go beyond just believing just because somebody told us, and just because we feel, but also because we know. Those things are important. It is important to, to feel God and to know God. That is the relational aspect to him. But it's so much powerful when you know and understand that God is, and you can explain that to others. And not only is it great to do that, guess what? It is a command of God to do that. Did you all know that? That God actually tells us to be able to do that? If you were here last week, you know this. But in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15, he says, But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. So we as believers have a responsibility to not only believe, but also be able to explain to people why we believe what we believe, and do it in a manner that meets them where they are. Some people come to the Lord because he engages their heart and they feel something. Other people come to the Lord because he engages their mind and he reveals something. So we need to be ready for both, to be able to love people with an unconditional love that can only come from the Father, but then also engage in conversation with people intellectually and be able to explain why we believe what we believe. This is a command of God. 
So with that command comes the responsibility to study. But then the question comes in, well, what do we study? Last week we studied what's called general revelation. General revelation is how God reveals himself to everyone, everybody, everyone on this planet, so that they are without excuse when they say, oh, well, I didn't know there was a God, really? You look at the sun and the moon. You look at the, the order and the systems that were created, the laws that govern uh, this physical realm, and you're going to say there's no God? Really? I don't believe that. With all due respect, I don't believe in atheists. I don't. And, and, and I say that with confidence because the Bible says you have no excuse. You know God has revealed himself to you. So you're not, you're not saying there is no God. You're trying to convince yourself that there is no God because we want to be God. We want to be God. But how do we know this? How do we know these things about God? How do we know his will? How do we know that this is, this is true? It's because we have the word of God, the Bible. We have the Bible that teaches us God's character, reveals his will to us, and teaches us how to interact with him. But how do we know the Bible's true? Anybody ever wondered? I mean, you say the Bible, and because of culture, there's a certain reverence that it carries. Even unbelievers won't dismiss it or, or, or say bad things about it a lot of times, you know, unless they're a dogmatic atheist and they want to destroy the Word of God. But a lot of people, even if they say they don't believe in God, they show it a certain level of, of reverence and, and respect. But how do we know, outside of what we've been told, that this is true? I went on a, on a journey of discovery when I was in my, my late teens, early 20s, because I thought, because God gave me the ability to think, if I'm going to base my entire life on this book, it better be true. Think about it. I base my, my marriage on it, how I raise my children on it, what I do with my finances, how I treat my neighbor, how I respect authority, what I believe is going to happen to me when I die for all eternity, how I view the world itself. I base everything on this book. Shouldn't we know that it's real and that it's true? And let me tell you, by asking questions, that doesn't show a lack of faith. It actually demonstrates you're exercising your ability to discover God in a deeper way. So people say, oh, well, you know, don't, don't ask any questions. Yeah, ask a lot of questions. You read in the Bible, you see prophets, they're questioning God all the time, respectfully, with reverence, but they question. So I questioned, okay, I believe it's real. I believe it's true, but how do I know? And in my discovery, I discovered that there are many people who had asked this question over the years and that there was a, a, a list of questions that were come up that uh, skeptics came up with to kind of qualify a writing that would say it came, it, it came from, from God and was divinely inspired. So there are 10 criteria that they listed would have to be true or met in order for this Bible to actually be the Word of God. So when you walk out of here today, you're going to know that the Word of God is true that it is inspired by God, you'll be able to explain it to others and be fully convinced yourself. Y'all ready for that? Yeah. All right, just needed three and I got it. We're good. So I'm going to go down this list of criteria and then give you the evidence for that. But I want to preface our discussion today on this. When we say the Word of God, I am talking about the authoritative command and revelation of God, the only tangible revelation that he left us so that we can know him. And I believe that the Bible is the absolute final authority on everything that it speaks on. That's the place that I'm coming from. It is the absolute final authority. So when we go to discover evidences that support this being that, I want to make sure that we understand that if I appeal to archaeology to validate the Word of God, it is merely to supply evidence. Because if I'm saying that archaeology just proves the Bible, then what has become the standard then? Archaeology. So God's Word is final 
period, because it's true. Not because archaeology said so, because then archaeology is final, or science is final, or uh, uh, history is final. No, the Word of God is the final authority. These are just the supporting cast. You guys understand what I'm saying? And it's important to have that in order. Otherwise, we exalt something above the Word of God when the Word of God itself is highly exalted. It is the supreme authority, and we are just looking at evidence that states that, not something that makes it the authority. God makes it the authority. Amen? So I just wanted to make that clear as we start. So the first criteria, and I'm going to move quickly, is this. It would claim to be God's Word. If the Bible is from God, they said, well, it would have to be clearly stated that this is the Word of God. Turn in your Bibles to 2 Timothy chapter 3. We're going to look at 2 Timothy here, but all throughout Scripture, it is clear that those who are being used by God to write His Word and give us His truth say, Behold, the word of the Lord came to me. The word of the Lord says, Behold, this is the word of the Lord. The Lord had written. So we see that everywhere. But just so it is clearly seen and clearly understood, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16 clearly says, All Scripture is given by inspiration or is God-breathed and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. All Scripture is given by God. So the Bible meets that criteria. It clearly states, God said. You don't find this in every religious writing. In Hinduism, in Buddhism, and all that. They don't claim Buddhism. They don't even believe in, in a God. They have a, a more pantheistic view where they believe things are God and not that there is one intelligent God. So their writings don't believe that they are inspired by a God. Hinduism, all these things, they don't believe that. But the Pentateuch, where we have the, the Torah, inspired by God and claimed to be inspired by God. The New Testament claims to be inspired by the Holy Spirit, breathed by God. So it meets that criteria. The Bible says this is the Word of God. So that means that either the Bible is completely lying or it's true. It can only be true or false. So it either is the Word of God or it is not, because it clearly says that it is. So we can eliminate that one right there. Criteria number one, it is met. Number two, if this is the Word of God, then it would be historically accurate when it speaks on historical matters. If the Bible says that some general stormed across the earth and conquered everybody, but there's no evidence of that, we don't know that, and that's not consistent with history, it would cause us to question whether it's true. And if you're wrong on that, and it's inspired by God, wouldn't it be wrong on anything else? So that means it would have to be completely accurate when it comes to history. Well, let me tell you, did you guys know that the Bible, even though they won't tell you, even though they won't admit it, at least the secular ones, is still used as a standard for discovering history. They still use it to discover who was in leadership at a particular time. It is a point of reference from them as a historical document, not just a religious writing. And not only that, it has been challenged over the years by great historians to, again, try and disprove the authenticity of the Bible. One in particular, Sir William Ramsey. Anybody heard of Sir William Ramsey? Mid-19th century historian and prolific writer. He went on a mission to try and disprove the writings of Luke. Luke, the physician, traveled with Paul and wrote to Theophilus the Gospel of Luke, the account of Jesus, his, his birth, life, death, burial, and resurrection. And then he also wrote the book of Acts. These two are probably the most dynamic and detailed accounts of the early church in the entire, in the entire Bible. Luke was not only a physician, but he was a historian. But Sir William Ramsey thought he was a fraud. 
because they had not seen any evidence for some of the leadership that he referenced or the time frames. He thought the time frames were off because they had no archaeological evidence to support it. So he said, look, if I can go out, if I can disprove Luke, who is to be the, the greatest biblical historian and contributor to the Bible, then we can just dismiss the rest of it. So he traveled to Israel. He traveled to these places. He went all the way from all the way over there just to disprove it. And you know what his conclusion was? He said this, after thinking Luke was a fraud. There are reasons for placing the author of Acts among historians of the first rank. He said, Luke knew things that we didn't even know. As a matter of fact, the book of Acts needs to become a standard for the study of history of that time period. This is a non-believer who went out to disprove the Bible, but only found that it was more accurate than what they knew. Later on, archaeology would substantiate Luke's claims because they would verify the leaderships in place. It would verify their positions. I mean, even intricate details where one person's uh, title was changed because of shift in, the, in politics. Luke records that. And they didn't even know it until they found some tablet. But Luke recorded it, and it's been, been passed on in the church for years. And we've known this, but they're just not, oh, you guys were right. The history of the Bible is accurate. Even now, they're discovering, just in 2018, they uncovered amazing finds that substantiate the kingdom of Israel, King Hezekiah. They even found, this was a, this was a huge one. This was a huge one. They wanted evidence of Isaiah, the prophet Isaiah, one of the key contributors to the, the texts that were found in the Dead Sea Scrolls. They're like, yeah, fine, you found all these texts in these Dead Sea Scrolls that are thousands of years old, but what about the author? We don't even know if he even existed. Well, guess what? They found recently tablets that say the prophet Isaiah right next to coins that say King Hezekiah. They're like, oh, okay, you're right on that one. Okay, you got us on that one. Listen, the Bible says that if we would be cry quiet, the rocks would cry out. Guess what? The rocks are crying out, and they are giving up the evidence and the praise of the Creator and saying, don't get it twisted. This is real. The rocks are crying out, church. So the historicity of the Bible has been scrutinized for years, and yet no one can deny it. It is fact. It is truth and stands up to the most rigorous of scrutiny from the most educated of historians. Number three says that the authors would be trustworthy. It means that the reputation of those people who wrote the scriptures would be something that could be measured and, 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 and seen, and then we could, we could rely upon that. Well, it's very difficult to try and measure the integrity of an individual who's passed on several thousand years ago. However, again, looking at Luke the physician and his accuracy in detailing the account of the apostles, when we look at the apostles themselves who wrote these letters under great persecution and, listen, within their writings, they were honest about themselves. For example, if most people were going to write an autobiography about themselves or detail their lives, do you think they would put their indiscretions in it and all their faults and failings? Would you write about the time when you abandoned Jesus and left him? Would you write about the fact that you messed up and were a hypocrite and had to be called out? Are these the types of things that you would write about? Most of the time, no. Usually, and y'all can attest to it. sometimes you just, you know you put a little extra something on it just to make yourself sound a little bit better. They were completely honest and even revealed their faults to the entire world. 
So can we trust these authors who are so intent on delivering the truth that they did not even hide their own faults from the entire world? I think we can trust them. Fourth criteria, the book would be thematically unified and without contradictions. It would be thematically unified and without contradictions. People say, oh, well, the Bible is just a compilation of books written by a ton of people. Well, that's actually what makes it unique and amazing. The Bible was written by over 40 different authors over a span of almost 1,500 years on three different continents, three different languages. And yet, and, and by the way, through different cultures, different influences, and different types of people. You didn't have scribes writing this all the time. You had farmers, fishermen, royalty, prophets, tax collectors, tent makers. I mean, you didn't have hardly any scholars in there. Yet through it all, they keep a consistent theme of redemption through the entire Bible. Everything in the Bible points to Jesus Christ and his finished work on the cross. Whether directly or indirectly through poetry, it highlights that there will be a Savior who comes from God, who takes away the sin of the world and redeems us back to our Father because we lost it in the garden. Every single book of the Bible points to that reality. And today, in the news, you can have a story that happened five minutes ago, and these people who are professional journalists can't deliver the same story. This one's saying this thing, and this one's saying the other, and we got iPhones and all kind of stuff, and we can't get it straight for five minutes, but we got 5,000 years of history, and it all lines up without contradiction. Now, skeptics will say, they, they have this number, we have 400,000 contradictions in the Bible. 400,000. And I've looked at some of them, and the large part of them, there are contradictions. It's found in translation, in dialect, in the translation of the dialect and how they use different words. We see that even in our, in our writings today. You know, you have the New King James Version, the Living Version, and all these different versions and everything. They amplify that just says everything. You got it all. But what doesn't change is the message for most of those translations. There are some that are just no good, but that's for another time. But thematically, they are correct. And any supposed contradictions that they see in the scriptures are easily explained. When you want to find something wrong, you will find something or create something. But there is, it is without contradiction. The theme is correct. God will send a redeemer. God will send a redeemer. So it passed that test. Listen to this. Five, we would have received accurate copies of the original manuscripts. This is always a funny criteria to me because the amount of manuscripts that we have for other historical writings is laughable. It's laughable. We may have 60 manuscripts on an ancient writing that, and those earliest manuscripts are a thousand years after the original one was written. So what that means is, if we had, for example, the closest, the closest historical writing to the Bible in terms of the number of manuscripts and the distance of time between it being written and it actually happening is the Homer's Iliad. There are 1,892 manuscripts. The earliest ones are about 1,000 years removed from when it was actually written. But we read that in schools and we, we, we use this as, as history. The Bible... The most recent count, based on the most recent findings, has 66,420 manuscripts. The closest other historical document, 1,892. The Bible, 66,420 manuscripts. 
that validate the translation of the Bible. That is mind-blowing. That is mind-blowing. And some of the manuscripts that we have, not a thousand years removed, but 35 to 40 years removed from the actual writing. 35 to 40 years. That means that there's not enough time for myth and legend to come in. It, it was true. It was accurate. There's more evidence that Jesus Christ existed than Julius Caesar. Yeah, we teach him in school and read his books and make movies about him all the time. And let me be quite honest. If it was just based on documentation, there's more proof that the Bible's real than you are. What do you got, a birth certificate and a driver's license? Two forms of ID? Credit card if they'll accept it? 66,420 manuscripts, ancient writings that verify that the Bible has been accurately transmitted over these thousands of years. That is God. He watches over his word. So, oh, well, I don't know if the Bible is real. Well, I got 66,420 pieces of information that says it is. How many you got? Uh, Wikipedia? You just disqualified yourself. It passes the test of manuscripts with flying colors. Now we're getting into the good stuff, y'all. Number six, this is where they start trying to, to really get at you. No, this is, this is six. Number one, it would claim to be God's word. Number two, it would be historically accurate. Number three, the authors would be trustworthy. Number four, the book would be the, uh, thematically unified. Number five, it, we would have accurate copies of manuscripts. Number six, it would make statements that would reveal knowledge about the way things work beyond the knowledge of its day. So if this was written by God, then God would know how all of life works, Right? So you wouldn't find things in his writing that would be contradictory to what he created, correct? There would have to, it would have to be accurate. He would have to know some stuff and have revealed some stuff before we had the ability ourselves within our human discovery to know that, correct? Man, let me tell you some stuff. One of the laws in Jewish tradition was the circumcision of a male child on the eighth day. It's been there for thousands of years. That has been the tradition. You circumcise a child on the eighth day. Now, one of the things that you are supposed to do when you give birth to a child, I've got some experience with this, not birthing them, but having been there. <laughs> is the children, once they are born, are supposed to immediately receive a vitamin K shot. Vitamin K1. They get this shot because it helps their blood clot. Because when they're babies, they don't have the ability to fully clot their blood. So if there's any bleeding, they could actually bleed internally, or they could be cut and they can continue bleeding because their body hasn't fully produced the ability to, to clot. So you're thinking, wow, God's telling them to circumcise these kids and they don't have the ability to clot. These kids could bleed out. Wrong. Because science just discovered that when a child is eight days out of the womb, their clotting ability is at the highest it will ever be in their life. When you are eight days old, you are at the peak of your clotting ability. Your body is its strongest to clot, and then it starts to go down as we get older. But on the eighth day, exactly. Doesn't matter in reference to your due date, on the eighth day after being out of the womb, you have the highest level of clotting ability ever. And God says, on this day, you will circumcise your sons. What? Quiet yourself. I can just drop the mic on that right there and say, let's go home. How do they know that? They don't know that. They didn't, have the, they didn't even know what you know, what was in the blood. All they knew was life was in the blood, and that's another thing. Life is in, you know, they can take a drop of blood and fall, figure out all your life. They know exactly what you've been through, what you've got, what you're fighting about your family. The life is in the blood, the Bible says. But now we know that. 
Come on. God knows what he's talking about. He's no fool. Let's look at some other things. Oh, I got to go. I got to go here just real quick. Isaiah chapter 40, verse 22. Isaiah 40, verse 22. We're going to get into some common, I mean, some, uh, some current discussions in this one. Isaiah chapter 40, verse 22. says, let's start at 21 just because it kind of leads into it nicely. It says, have you not known? Have you not heard? Has it not been told to you from the beginning? Have you not understood from the foundations of the earth? It is he who sits above the circle of the earth and inhabits, uh, and, uh, and its inhabitants are like grasshoppers who stretch out the heavens like a curtain and spreads them out like a tent to dwell in. He brings the princes to nothing. He makes the judges of the earth useless. What do you see in that? It is he who sits above the circle of the earth. Let me tell you all something. The earth is not flat. The earth is not flat. Number one, the Bible says it is a circle, sphere, and the the Lord says he sits above it. They didn't have telescopes back then. They hadn't sent a man to the moon. By the way, why is the moon round and the earth is flat? I don't know. Why would that be the case? It just breaks all the laws of gravity and everything that we know if the earth is flat. So I don't know if anybody's into that or anything. We can talk about that afterwards, but the earth is round, y'all, and this proves it. The circle of the earth. How did they know that? Everybody thought the earth was flat. If you look at the maps, even thousands of years after this, it's like it shows like you're falling off the edge of the world. It's like danger zone. Once you cross this, you will fall off into nothing. That's what they thought. That's what they thought. But God said, no, y'all, it's a circle. Hello? It's a circle. And we're like, are you sure about that, God? Yes, he was. Thousands of years ago, he was certain of it and told us that. It also says in the Bible that the Lord uh, uh, has set the earth to sit upon nothing. How did they know that the earth sits upon nothing? They don't know about the vacuum of space. Most of the people thought it was like this big, thick blanket, and they poked holes in it or something. They didn't know about that. They didn't know that the stars were as vast as they thought. You know that the Bible says that compares the sand on the earth to the amount of stars there are in the heavens. And based on scientific calculations, they're only only within a billion or so off, within the billions off of the number of sands on the earth and the stars in the heavens. With the naked eye, you can only see about 3,000 stars at any given time. Why would they, you know, relate 3,000 stars to all the sand on the earth? How would they know that that's even comparable? You know, we see, we see pictures now where they take them through a special lens and you can like see all the heavens and it looks just like all these stars. You don't see that with your eyes. You only see that through special lenses. The most they were seeing on the clearest of nights was a total of 3,000 stars, yet they compared it to the sands on the sea and that's within a few billion according to scientific calculations. What? God knew something. They weren't just throwing random things out here. God had revealed something to them who wrote this. Number seven, it would make predictions about the future that could not be known through natural means. The Bible is the only historical writing that accurately accurately predicts future events. People say, oh, well, the Quran predicts certain events. And No, all of the Quran's predictions, it was Muhammad uh, predicting about himself, and they were self-fulfilled. So I can say, I predict I will shift to this side of the room. <laughs> Looky there. Yeah, doesn't count, man. Doesn't count. That was in, within your power to control that, so that doesn't count. That's not prophetic, that's pathetic. 
But the Bible, not only do they predict things in the immediate future, but God, through his wisdom, allows things to be predicted in the distant future so that there is no way that the people of this time could impact the things of this time. I'll give you a great example. Turn to Daniel chapter 8. Daniel chapter 8. You all know where I'm going with this. I'm going to paraphr paraphrase just for time's sake. I want you guys, this, this is homework. Go and read Daniel chapter 8. And then I want you to do a little history lesson on a conqueror named Alexander the Great. Daniel, who wrote his revelation uh, in, the, in the 600 B.C. time frame. About 606 B.C. is when we see this being written. Alexander the Great came on the scene 336 B.C., died 323 B.C., he started ruling and reigning at 336, died 323. So you got about a 300-year difference between what Daniel talks about in uh, Daniel chapter 8 and prophesies and what actually happens with Alexander the Great. As a matter of fact, there's even historical reference to Alexander the Great finding the transcripts and reading about himself 300 years before. How scary is that? But it details an account of a goat moving from east to west. And there's a great ram with two horns. This goat has one horn, and it tramples over the ram, takes dominion over it. But then its horn gets broken, and it divides into four kingdoms. He was talking about Alexander the Great. He said it was Greece, the goat representing a pagan society. And that's exactly what Alexander the Great did. He came with ferocious military strategy, conquered Persia. I mean, Persia was something that you don't mess with, but he overthrew them in, in, in a convincing way, completely trampled him. But then it says that the horn broke off in its authority, which means that the horn means authority. It usually means a ruler, a king, but that he would die young. Alexander the Great died very young. And because he left no successor, guess what happened? His four generals split up his kingdom, just like Daniel said. But then those four kingdoms eventually settled into two separate kingdoms. Just like Daniel said. How did he know that? How was he able to detail that? And certainly at the time that he was saying it, Macedonia, where he came from, was nothing to be feared. Nothing to be feared. But he prophesied that. And there are so many other things. Jesus predicted the destruction of the temple that happened 70 years after his death, burial, and resurrection. The city of Tyre was predicted that it would be destroyed and never built up again. And guess what? The city of Tyre has been destroyed, and they never built it up again. All you have to do in order to prove the Bible wrong is go build a house in Tyre. Just build, build the city and prove the Bible wrong. But why haven't they done it over thousands of years? Because God won't allow it. Because his word is true. Period. There are so many other predictions. We don't have time to go into all of them. But when the Bible says something is going to happen, it happens. Whether it's a year later or 300 years later, it's true. No other book does that or even comes close. Not even close. Number eight, the message would be unique. The message would be unique. Every other religion in the world, every other philosophy really too, is about man helping himself or helping himself get to God. Buddhism, Hinduism, Sikhism, Zoroastrianism, Taoism, self-help, even atheism. It's about how man can take control of this world. That's what it's about. It's about control. And people think, oh, all religions are basically the same. You be a good person and everything kind of works out, yada, yada, yada. Well, guess what? Not all religions are the same. As a matter of fact, they're only kind of the same in terms of basic morality. And that's only true because God has put that in your heart and we all know it. That's why it's the same is because God put the same thing in our hearts, a basic morality. But the message of the cross is different. 
The message of the cross is this. God knows that you couldn't do anything to get to him. You couldn't be good enough. You couldn't be smart enough. You could not reach him. The message of Christianity is this. God reached out to you. God came down to earth as a man to relate to you. And because you were not able, he died on the cross. And there's no amount of works that you can do in order to receive this. It's by faith in him and the grace of God that you are saved. Islam, if you do enough good works, Allah will have mercy on you. Maybe. There's no even guarantee of salvation. You know, Jehovah's Witness and everything, it's like, they're, they're close, but only 144,000 get to heaven? What about the rest of us? No. Christ offers salvation to all who will receive him because we couldn't do it. That is different than any other religion. And not only that, but he is the only one who says, I am God. Buddha didn't say I'm God. Muhammad didn't say I'm God. But Jesus did, and we're going to talk about that next week. So the message is unique. Number nine, the messengers would be confirmed by miracles. We have eyewitness testimony of miracles that were done. And if it was a lie, then why would they die for it? I'm not going to die for a lie that I made up. If I'm trying to pretend to be something that I'm not and do something that I can't do, am I really going to allow myself to be crucified upside down like Peter was for a lie? No, I'd be like, just kidding. I was just kidding. Joke. <laughs> Joke's on you. I was just playing. But he said, no, I'm willing to go to the cross because I know what my eyes have seen. And John himself as an eyewitness says, that which we have seen, that which we have heard, that which we have handled with our hands, this we testify to you. I saw it. I heard it with my own hands. I handled him. This is the one true God. This is Jesus the Christ who came into the world that we might be saved. And all of them died a martyr's death except John because they couldn't kill that brother. <laughs> they kept trying to kill him. They tried to boil him. They tried to do all these things, but they couldn't kill him. They're just like, put him on a rock. Get rid of him. And then he writes the greatest revelation of the end times. He was confirmed by miracles. And the last one is this, and I'll end here. And this has something to do with you and I. Not with the word itself, but with you and I and how we handle the word. The tenth qualifier, according to these secular skeptics, on if the word of God would be real, if it is true, if it is truly written by God, you know what it is they said? They said, it would have transforming power. Transforming power. That means when all else fails, when you've tried all the gurus, when you've tried all the science, when you've tried all the, the pills, when you've tried all this other stuff, the word of God has the ability to transform you in every way and every aspect of your life. The word of God transforms if we will allow it. That is the evidence. As Christians, we can't say we, we believe this and then not allow our lives to be transformed by it. I don't know about you, but when God got a hold of me or I let him get a hold of me because I resisted him, man, once he came in, he crushed and broke down and transformed me and I became a new man. I remember when I died. I remember when I died and I became something new. I thought I was new. But I wasn't. His word came in and crushed me and made me something different. And I've got people who can testify of that. I'm not the same. I was different. I was different. And that is our responsibility to let his word come in and do what it's going to do. His word does not return void. What he says is what he says. And what he says happens. It is power. But if that's true, it meets all this criteria. And this is just a small snippet. I could preach for months on the evidences. But if this is true, if this Bible is real, church, what are we doing? You have the living God, the creator of the universe, who spoke the most important things for you to know went through the trouble of having mankind write them down, working with, together with them side by side because he wants us to know that he wants to work with us. He wrote it all down, and then we let it be 
a paperweight on our desk, a dust collector on our side table. Decor in our house, an accessory on our way to church. This is power. This is truth. Why would we not read it? Why would we not accept it? Why would we not live it if this is true? See, the problem is, is we've allowed this word to become too common. We treat it like it's common. A uh, text message came to me a few weeks ago about the attempts of certain people in government to begin testing the limitations they can put on the Word of God. We had one here in California. AB 27, I think it was. Can't remember exactly what the, what the code was. But it was basically saying that any literature that came against uh, the homosexual or alternative lifestyle would be considered hate speech. And it wasn't directly said, but it was kind of an indirect test to see how close they could get to getting the Bible illegal or removed. Because it's coming. I mean, that's the attempt. And I'm not going to be shy about it. We know who's trying to do it. We say the devil, but there's a certain movement within a certain party that kind of advocates that. I'm being careful. But it, but it is what it is. It, and and I, don't, I don't mean to be coy, but I, we, we want to talk about the reality of things. That there's, a, there's an agenda. There's an absolute agenda that is being pushed, and we need to be aware of that. We cannot pretend like it's not there. It is. It's there. But it's being tested again. You know, it's kind of like gas prices. They just try and raise it up a little bit, and all of a sudden, five years later, boom, we're paying five bucks a gallon. You're like, what happened? Well, it's being tested. being tested y'all and look I got this text message and it was saying look we gotta we gotta fight against this because eventually they're gonna try and start trying to take Bibles away it's happened before in history and we're foolish to think that it couldn't happen again but then I thought about it I said you know what that may not be the worst thing that could happen to us as a matter of fact I think it would be good I think one of the best things that could happen to Christianity is some good old-fashioned persecution and taking away our Bibles. Uh, what, preacher? Let me tell you why. What makes something valuable? Scarcity. We can go to the 99-cent store and get a Bible, and because we can go to the 99-cent store and get a Bible... We treat it like it's worth 99 cents. There's a, a video that I saw years ago of an underground church in China. Now, you guys know communist China pretty much outlaw anything that has to do with God. Socialist society, in order for a socialist society to function, the government must be God. So they eliminate God. Just as a heads up, y'all. They eliminate God and then heavy persecution on the church. People in prison for decades, years, tortured for preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. This underground church, a box comes in. And they don't know what it is because they have to be so careful when they're doing this. But there's probably about 100 people in this small room tucked away because they cannot be discovered. They open up this box. And you know what's inside of it? Bibles. Tears pour out of their eyes. A praise like you won't see at any Hillsong concert erupts. And they are ecstatic. And they dive in over each other to grab this Bible. And all these Bibles are distributed. And then you know what happens next? Complete silence. As they hug and kiss the Bible and begin to read it. And all you can see is one of them, this young man, he couldn't be more than 19, 20 years old, just tears in his eyes, bawling. 
And he just looks at the camera and he says, this is what we've needed this entire time. And he's just crying, weeping, because he has the truth, the word of God. It means something to them. I mean, we talk about the book of Acts church. They didn't have complete Bibles. They had to make copies of the letters, and they would just share. If I could get one page of what Paul wrote to Timothy, I would, I would love that. And they would exchange them with great care. Okay, this week we're going to take what Paul wrote to Timothy. Next week you take what he wrote to Romans. And they would read it, and they would exchange it. It was valuable to them. If this is true, what should we do with it? If this is true, if we believe this, what do, we, what do we do with this precious gift that people went blind for, people lost their lives for? You know, that they would, they would go blind translating the Bible because they'd have to do it by night because the church at that time didn't want it in the hands of the common people. So they'd do it by night by candlelight, and they would lose their eyes because there's hundreds of thousands of characters that they would have to write by hand so that somebody could finally read it. But here we are with printing presses, with leather bound, with it on our phones, and you can get any translation. Heck, they'll even text you a word of the day. But we treat it like it's just some good advice so we can obtain whatever we want here on this earth. I don't mean to be a Debbie Danner, but I want to sober you to the idea of being without this. What would that mean? Are you desperate for it? Are you hungry for it? Do you read it? Do you crave it like you crave coffee in the morning? Do you revere it and seek to obey it? Just like you would someone who is of great prestige that you honor? Whatever field you desire to be in, there's usually somebody that's in that field that you admire, and if they walked into the room and gave you instruction on something, you would do it immediately just because they told you to. Heck, some of you ballers in here, man, LeBron James walks in and says, hey, do this drill and you'll be awesome. You'd be doing it every single day religiously because someone who has attained greatness had told you to do it, but yet we treat the Word of God, the one who created all things, as if it means nothing. If this is real... If this is true, then church, we need to get hungry. We need to get hungry, and we need to let the Word of God loose in our life. We need to start reading it. We need to put down Netflix. We need to put down the movies. We need to put down all that stuff. Stop binging on that and start binging on the Word. What would your life be like if the transforming power of the Word of God was in your system as regularly as your entertainment? What would happen? Oh, you would think different, you would walk different, you would talk different, you would live different, and people would not be able to deny the presence of God in your life. They would say, what is wrong with me and right with you? So church, knowing this is real, knowing this is true, what will you do with it? Bow your heads with me. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for the truth of your word. We are so grateful, Lord God, that you took the time to bring us the word of God. You knew we would need it in these times. Other time, times past did not have what we had, but they also didn't have the challenges that we have. So, Lord, we are asking that you would awaken our hunger for the word. That you would awaken in us a strong desire to read, study, and obey and live out your scriptures. Father, we repent for treating it like it's just another book to read. These are the very things that you thought most important for us to know and understand in our journey to eternity. Shame on us for not revering it. Father, we just ask that you would lead us by your Holy Spirit into your word and to a full understanding of it, Lord God. We ask for a reverence to have towards it. And Lord, that it would be powerful and transforming in our lives so that we could be witnesses to those who have yet to receive salvation. We need that, Father. 
And we thank you that you are faithful to finish the work that you have begun in us, Lord God. Thank you, Lord. I just want to ask you very quickly, if there's anybody in here and you haven't accepted that you are a created being, that there is a God in heaven who made you, loves you, knows you, and wants to spend eternity with you. I want to give you an opportunity to know him, and it happens in this manner, that you believe that he is. You accept what he's done for you, and that is that he came down to earth himself to die for your sins, because all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, and we must be perfect to have fellowship with him. But he died so that you could be perfect. If you accept that sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ and you believe that not only did he die, but he was raised on the third day, proving that he had dominion over death, then you will inherit eternal life. And then it begins a wonderful journey of discovering who he is and who he's created you to be. Without him, you're not, you're not certain of your purpose, nor are you certain of your destiny. But with him, you will know that and be assured of it. And if that's you, you need to make that decision today. I want to give you an opportunity just to raise your hand. And by raising your hand, you're saying, yes, I want to take those steps to know Jesus in that way. I want to repent for my sins. Repent is just a fancy religious word that means you turn away from your old life and towards a new life that he has in you. When you do that, you'll know that you know that God is real. You'll know your purpose, and he'll lead you to it. That I know. Just as much as I know that that Bible is real, I know that to be true. So if you need that, just lift your hand up high and just say, yep, I need Jesus Christ in that way. Anybody at all? Amen. Amen. Anybody else? Let me ask you. If you've, if you've known the Lord and you've walked with him, but you've never given him full place in your life, you've said, you know what, I've kind of known Jesus, but I haven't let him take control of my life. He's been, he's been Savior of my life, but I haven't let him be Lord. See, he needs to be Lord and Savior. The Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. If you want him to be Lord of your life, just lift up your hand right now and just say, yep, he's going to be Lord of every area of my life. Anybody at all? Anybody at all? Amen. 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 Get up out of your seat and come down here. Let's pray. Let's be bold about it. Come on. The Holy Spirit's given you boldness. Come down and let's pray together.